The following is a brief tutorial on how to apply the Registrant Risk Assessment Scale in a Megan's Law case. Please bear in mind that this is not a substitute for a more thorough understanding of RRAS application. One needs to be completely familiar with the Registrant Risk Assessment Scale manual as well as the case law in this area in order to effectively evaluate sex offenders. However, consider this an orientation. You'll see on the screen now a Registrant Risk Assessment Scale that I have done today for a sex offender who was recently released from prison. And you will notice that the scale is broken down into a number of parts. The first category is seriousness of offense. The second category is offense history. The third category is characteristics of the offender. And the last category is community support. Each of these categories are weighted differently. Let's take a look at category one, seriousness of the offense. Since this is directed at not only the degree of risk that a sex offender poses, but also the potential gravity of the harm, the scale weights this the highest. So it is a power of five or a multiplier of five that is applied in the three criteria under seriousness of offense. You will also see that for each criteria there are three levels of risk, low risk, moderate risk, and high risk. So in applying a categories multiplier one must look at the level of risk and then multiply it by the number that the category requires. Let's take a look by way of example. Degree of force. This criteria has three levels of risk. Low risk, moderate risk, and high risk, as they all do. A low risk example involves no physical force and no threats. A moderate risk example involves threats or minor physical force. And a high risk example involves significant violence, use of a weapon, or significant victim harm. In this case, the registrant threatened the victim LD and showed her a scar on his hand that he claimed was a gunshot wound and in the process of sexually assaulting her said that he would kill her and that this gunshot wound was evidence of his seriousness. Now as terrible as that sounds if you look at the registrant risk assessment manual it's a threat and it is considered a moderate risk there was no evidence of actual violence, he didn't use a weapon, and there was no evidence of significant victim harm. So this was a moderate risk on degree of force. If you go up to the top, you'll see that this is a factor of one in this category multiplied by five gives you your total for this criteria degree of force five. Again the multiplier is five the criteria is moderate risk so you multiply five times this one uh, the different criteria have this escalating risk factor zero one and three so five times one equals five now let's take a look at criteria two degree of contact the three examples of risk are low risk, no contact, or fondling over the clothing, moderate risk, fondling under the clothing, and penetration, which is considered a high risk. In this case, the sex offender had intercourse with both of his victims. Well, actually, the second victim, I stand corrected. The first victim 
he digitally penetrated her, or placed his fingers inside her vagina. Either way, they are acts of penetration. And you'll see here that we're still in seriousness of the offense category with a multiplier of 5. However, for criteria 2 degree of contact, this is the highest risk when you have a penetration. So you multiply the 5 times the 3, and you get 15. And that's how you proceed with the registrant risk assessment scale. You read the file. You learn about the sex offender's prior history. And the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. So you take the information from the sex offender's history and you apply it to this scale. And although it sounds simple, it takes a little getting used to. Let's look at criteria three age of victim. This is really an arithmetic process. You just look in the file and find out how old the victim was. Whatever the age of the youngest victim is, that's the age that you use. In this case, the first victim was 14, the second victim was 15. It doesn't really matter because the moderate risk is ages 13 to 17, so both of them put him in the moderate risk level. So we take the multiplier of 5 times the moderate risk factor of 1. 5 times 1 is 5. So for this category, seriousness of the offense, Eric Harris has 5 points, 15 points, and 5 points for a subtotal of 25. Now before we move over to offense history, I want to make a comment about criteria 2 degree of contact. You'll see there was a penetration in this case and you may recall that the first victim was digitally penetrated. Now in that case she claimed unambiguously that he put his fingers into her vagina. Now the difference between moderate risk and high risk is fondling under the clothing and penetration. Under our law in order to accomplish the act of penetration one needn't or state it differently, one does not have to actually enter the vaginal canal. So if there is contact between the finger, a digit, or an object, or a penis, and the unclothed vagina of a child or, a, or an adult victim, that is sufficient for our purposes to categorize that behavior as penetration. So you may read a file where a child says he put his finger and rubbed my vagina. Did he put it inside you? Maybe the next question. They may say no or I don't know. If there is skin to skin contact by a digit, by a finger or a penis or an object and a person's vagina unclothed and naked, then that is sufficient for our purposes for penetration. Okay? Also, acts of fellatio oral sex upon a male, the placing of the mouth on the penis or the penis into the mouth is penetration, as well as cunnilingus, oral sex upon a female, the placement of the mouth on the vagina. And there doesn't need to be any evidence of any actual penetration. Now on to offense history. We look at the criteria called victim selection next and we try to identify what the relationship was between the perpetrator and the victim. We know that persons who assault people that they are family members of or people who reside in their household are less likely to reoffend than those who assault strangers. Now if someone sexually assaults a stranger we can conclude that they are probably predatory, right? because if you attack someone you don't know it suggests that you look for your victims. The person who assaults someone who lives in the same home or a relative or a family member they are more likely to be considered situational offenders. Now what we mean about a situational offender is a person who is opportunistic, a person who takes advantage of a situation they have a 
superior access and opportunity to a vulnerable person, a child or someone who is disabled, um, someone who is in their household or they have supervision over. These kind of offenders are more exploitive than predatory and the research tells us that they're less likely to reoffend, and that's what this is all about, risk of reoffense. So a stranger is the most likely, those who prey on strangers are the most likely to reoffend, and those who take advantage of or exploit relationships are the least likely. And right in the middle are acquaintances. Now there is often some degree of controversy over how to exactly apply uh, these three risk levels. For example, in this case, the registrant met both of the victims on the street. In the first case, he was friendly with this girl, we'll call her T. He says hello to her on the street and he says, hey T, who's that person that you're with? And T says, this is my friend L. She's 14. He then starts chatting up L and kind of hustles them into his bedroom at his apartment and then he attacks L on his bed. Now, is that an acquaintance? Well, he was acquainted with one of the people, but L was someone who was unknown to him. Perhaps equally interesting is the second case. He's on a public bus, and he chats up a girl on the bus, a 15-year-old, and then meets her a day or two later. Now, what was on his mind when he chatted her up? Was he targeting her? Is he predatory? Is she a stranger or is she an acquaintance merely because he meets up with her at a later time? It's not that easy to tell, but because both of these persons were really, as one of my colleagues calls, high and by people or friends or acquaintances, that is, there really was no relationship, and I argue that an acquaintance requires more than fleeting contact or a fleeting relationship or minor contact. So I'm considering them strangers for this case and I characterized it as meeting both of them on the street. So let's take a look at criteria five now, number of offenses and victims. That's purely an arithmetic analysis. You just count the number of victims and you put an X in the level of risk. Here the level of risk is moderate so you have a moderate factor and now the multiplier is 3. In this category offense history the multiplier changes to 3. So 3 times a factor of 1 equals 3. And if we go back to victim selection which is under the offense history category it is 3 times a high risk factor of 3 for a total of 9. Moving down we have duration of offensive behavior. Less than one year, one to two years, or over two years. These offenses occurred almost nine years apart. What we're interested in here is when was the first time and when was the last time that this person engaged in sexually exploitive or sexually predative behavior. Very often it is chronic abuse upon a stepchild or a person who lives in the household and they're easy to figure out. This one's a little dicier because he commits an offense. There's no evidence that he did anything else but nine years later he commits another offense. I consider that to be over two years and I think you should apply a chronological analysis if you will. Look at the first incident and the last incident at the time that you're filling out the scale and see if it is less than one year, one to two years or over two years. And here, this is the highest risk under category offense history, so it is a factor of 3 times a multiplier of 3 for a total of 9. Moving down to criteria 7 in offense history, we want to look at the length of time since the last time the sex offender assaulted somebody. And here, it's one year or less. And the reason is, even though it happened in 2002, Eric Harris was in jail until December 1st, 2008. So any time spent in jail is considered 
not a time at risk. Any time where the sex offender is not at liberty, is not on the streets, if you will, is not counted. You only count time where the sex offender has free will and is at liberty and can do what they want. And this is a good predictor of future behavior. The longer you go without committing a sex offense, the less likely you are to reoffend. It really didn't work out in this case between 93 and 02 because that was more than five years, but it is a pretty good general predictor. So this is one where you kind of do the math as well. He got out on December 1st, 08. The factor is 3 times the multiplier of 3. You get a total of 9 here as well for one year or less. History of antisocial acts. You need to look in the file. You need to read what's called a pre-sentence report and also look at a criminal court history. Ask the Megan's Law detective, and that's currently Detective Maura Papagni, ask that detective where the CCH is or the criminal history is if you can't find it in the file. In this case, there is evidence in the file, and he had a 1994 gun charge, a 96 drug charge, that's CDS for controlled dangerous substance and a 2002 false swearing charge and all we need to look at is arrests and these are three separate arrests if there are less than three antisocial acts and that includes convictions or arrests adjudications of delinquency if a person got in trouble as a juvenile and was charged with juvenile delinquency antisocial acts can include behavior in school, truancy, excessive problems in school or institutions. It doesn't have to be a criminal conviction. But in our case, this registrant has three separate criminal convictions. So if you have up to three, between one and three, antisocial acts, that's considered a limit hist limited history. Zero acts, no history. One, two, and three acts, limited history, and more than three acts, extensive history. Now, this registrant has three antisocial acts. So he has a factor of one times a multiplier of three for a total of three. Now, if we add up the category offense history, we get 33. Okay, let's move down the risk assessment scale to the last two categories. And these are categories that we call soft categories. And what we mean by that is, is they are categories that can change uh, that are not related to facts that are largely immutable or unchanging. The literature refers to these as static and dynamic factors. Static factors are the factors that we looked at on top. The age of the victim, the number of victims, they're unchanging. Dynamic factors are factors that are capable of changing or can be changed over time. And they're at the bottom of our scale. They are less predictive, uh, so they're not weighted as high, but they are still meaningful. Look at criteria 9, response to treatment. This is an interesting one because we have to give good progress if there's no evidence that the person is in therapy and that's what happened here we have no information that this registrant is in any kind of therapy so therefore we cannot scale him for progress on response to treatment if you're not in therapy you can't make any kind of progress at all so he gets the benefit of doubt here he gets a zero for a total of zero substance abuse that's a factor that has meaning. People who use drugs or alcohol who abuse substances are more likely to reoffend than those who don't. Alcohol and drugs being disinhibitors, if you're inclined to molest, you're more likely to molest if you are intoxicated in some way. It lessens your inhibitions and makes you more likely to offend. So what we look for are convictions or statements in the pre-sentence report about the use of alcohol or drugs. You'll see pre-sentence reports in nearly all of these cases 
and they are the reports that are prepared by the judge before there is a sentencing on a guilty plea or on a conviction after jury trial. And they always ask the sex offender about their use of drugs or alcohol. In many cases, you will find a conviction for a drug offense. And here you have one. In 1996, the registrant was convicted of possession of controlled dangerous substances. I put, but see both PSR denials, because despite that, he denies when he was interviewed by the pre-sentence writer, the person from the probation department, in both cases he denied using drugs. But he has a conviction, so he is categorized as in remission. Now, anyone who ever had a substance abuse conviction or substance abuse problem is considered in remission. Once you use drugs or alcohol, you can never be in the low-risk area here, no history of abuse, you're at the very least in remission. And if there's current evidence that you're using drugs or alcohol, then it's not in remission. So here, this category uses a multiplier of two. And remember, this is the moderate risk, which has a factor of one. So two times one is two. So the registrant was scored a zero for treatment response, because he's not in treatment, and two points for prior substance abuse. And down here are some more categories that are capable of changing or dynamic criteria. Therapeutic support, residential support, and employment or educational stability. Therapeutic support, you're going to find that out from the detective in the case. It's usually not in the file. Okay? And even here, I found no evidence that he's in therapy, but I'm still waiting to hear from Detective Papagni. She is reaching out to the parole officer. So he may be in therapy and if I find that out later or when we're in court we can always modify these. We would modify number 11 and of course if he's in therapy then we can evaluate his response to treatment in criteria number 9. But since there's no evidence he's in therapy he gets no involvement which is a factor of 3 with a multiplier of 1 now. 1 times 3 is three. Residential support. Now this person got out of jail and he lived in a hotel for a while. Then he moved into a building with his aunt. Now I can't say that he's in a supportive, supervised setting, an appropriate location. We're concerned about residential support because when you live with supportive family members and friends, if you have people that you can lean on, that you can reach out to when you might reoffend or you might use drugs and think about sexual deviant acts again. When you have some support person, you're less likely to reoffend. So this is an important criteria. But sadly, many of these offenders really don't have that kind of support setting, support group, or people that they can reach out to. So they're almost always in the middle. Now, this registrant, I considered stable and appropriate location. He is with his aunt. There's no evidence of any external support system and nowhere in the file did there appear any evidence that he has a close personal relationship uh, with anybody. Um, he is in arrears on his child support. He is, um, uh, at best, uh, stable and appropriate with no external support. Now, if he's living in a problematic location near a daycare center, if he moves constantly, then you might consider him unstable and isolated. If the registrant continued to live in a hotel by himself, with no kin or family, I would have considered him isolated and unstable and given him three points here times a multiplier of one. But instead, I gave him one point here times a multiplier of one for a total of one. And lastly, we look at whether you have a job. And a job is important. If you have a job, you're less likely to get in trouble because you're busy, because you're doing something. It also builds self-confidence, and there's a lot of reasons why having a job is helpful in diminishing the risk of reoffense. You know, they say idle hands are the devil's toys or the devil's playthings. Well, if they're working, they're less likely to have idle hands. Unfortunately, this registrant is unemployed, and I found that out through his December 10, 2008 registration form. And if you want to find out if they're working, you can check with Detective Papagni or the Megan's Law Detective, or you can check their registration form, which has an entry for employment and find out there. 
but again all of these soft categories all of these community support criteria under the community support category and the category characteristics of the offender can be evaluated by speaking to the detective who will have spoken to or had some dialogue with the parole department who is supervising the sex offender not every sex offender is on parole but most are especially since we have a statute in New Jersey called parole supervision for life in any event the grand total is 67 that is a moderate risk sex offender what we call a tier 2 sex offender 37 to 73 points is tier 2 tier 1 is 0 to 36 and tier 3 the highest and this is the risk level that results in door-to-door -door community notification where we go out and tell the neighbors a tier 2 sex offender we tell schools and daycare centers and other institutions that have services or provide care for vulnerable populations battered women shelters maybe Cub Scout groups and Cub Scout troops and Girl Scouts and karate schools we tell institutions when there's a tier 2 finding we tell people including institutions when there's a tier 3 and if it's a low risk we only tell law enforcement in the communities where the sex offender has a presence so for example if the sex offender lives in Patterson but works in Clifton and has a summer house in Belmar we would tell the Patterson police because he lives there the Clifton police because he works there and the Belmar police because he has a second residence there and the same thing if he was a tier 2 or a tier 3 we would tell the tier 2 sex offenders community organizations where he lives works and has a summer home if that was the case and a tier 3 we would notify people in all three communities most sex offenders involve a residence and sometimes work so I hope this was helpful remember to use the risk assessment manual if you have any questions or need to resolve any ambiguity or any issues that you have and also reach out to any of the staff here to help you and we'd be happy to